Hello again, it's Gary Mrozinski, and I'm back for part B of chapter six, and this is in the Microeconomy Today by Schiller and Gebhardt, published by McGraw-Hill. We were just about to talk about how price elasticity of demand affects total revenue. Well, we're going to take a look at the curves first, the demand curves, and how it can depend on price elasticity of demand. Remember, as a review, once you've computed price elasticity of demand, if it's a number greater than one, then you say that that's a product that has elastic demand. If it's a number that's less than one, and it would be between zero and one, then it is a product that has inelastic demand. If it's exactly one, then it's neither elastic nor, nor inelastic. It is what's called unit elasticity. That's kind of the dividing line between elastic and inelastic, if it's exactly one. So how does this affect the shape of the curve? If, when you graph the curve, it appears steep, then that is a product that has inelastic demand. If it appears flat, then it is a product that has elastic demand. And I'll show you examples of that. So first, if it's steep, well, this is the most steep it could be, right? That's the steepest you can get if it's perfectly vertical. That would be perfect inelasticity. That would mean no matter what the price is, people are going to buy a certain amount of it. So maybe the product that comes the closest of products that we've already talked about, insulin. If you need insulin, you're going to buy just about the same amount no matter how much the price goes up. In this case, we're showing a price decrease, but you need so much per week, and that's how much you're going to buy. This is a little bit more realistic. This is a product that has very inelastic demand. So look at the price change. This looks like a price decrease of mm, maybe like 40%, almost 50% price drop. What's the change in the quantity demanded? It goes up, but not by 40 or 50%. It goes up by maybe 20%. All right, so that's an underreaction on the part of buyers. The price change was greater than the quantity change. That's inelastic demand when that happens. Now here's an example of a demand curve where you move from one point on the curve to the other curve. It's more like a 45 degree angle here. Well, it looks like the price change and the quantity change are pretty close to being the same. If that's the case, then your numerator is the same as your denominator and you have unit elasticity. So the demand is neither elastic nor inelastic. And this is a flatter looking demand curve. So again, what this means is just the way, you know, because of the slope of this curve, if the price decreases, and it looks like this is again, not quite a 50% decrease in price, but something close to it. Look how much the quantity changes though. So that's an overreaction on the part of buyers. When there's an overreaction, that's elastic demand. So the flatter the curve looks, the more elastic the demand is for that product. And this would be as flat as you can get, right? Perfectly horizontal. This is perfect elasticity. We're going to come back to this when we get to chapter, let's see, that will be chapter, chapter eight, when we talk about pure competition for the individual firm selling a product in a perfectly competitive market. Their demand curve looks horizontal. Uh, so we're going to come back to this in a couple chapters. Here are some products for which the price elasticity of demand has been measured over time. Remember that if the price elasticity of demand is between 0 and 1, it's inelastic demand. If it's greater than 1, it's elastic demand. So the whole first column and the the beginning of the second column, these are all products that have inelastic demand. The question is why of the determinants that we have reviewed. Newspapers, why so inelastic? People are not responsive at all to price changes, very little response. Well, for those buyers who still are buying newspapers, it's a necessity, I would say, and it's a relatively inexpensive product compared to their income. Electricity, definitely a necessity, right? 
when the price goes up, you'll find some way to decrease your energy consumption, but it's difficult to do because you some need some minimum amount of electricity to run your house. Uh, so that makes it inelastic. Bread, that's a food staple item. Uh, Major League Baseball tickets, there's an interesting one. If you're a Phillies fan and the price of a Phillies ticket were to double, people would be inelastic in their response. Why is that? Well, because what are the substitutes for Phillies tickets? Well, Major League Baseball, I guess I could go to a Mets game. Would you go to a Mets game? The Mets are your rival. Uh, no, you don't just jump from one team to another. You are brand loyal to whoever, whatever the team is that you're buying Major League Baseball tickets from. So there's no close substitutes, or at least I think that's the biggest factor. And let's skip down here. Cigarettes, why so inelastic? Because of the addictive qualities of cigarettes. Uh, legal services, when you need a lawyer, you need a lawyer, right? Automobile repair, same argument. Gasoline, clothing, necessities. Clothing, because of how broadly defined the uh, product is. And let's go on. We're in the second column now. Beer, this one surprises me, beer. I would have thought it would be more inelastic. Actually, a smaller price elasticity of demand than it is. It's pretty close to unit elasticity. How can that be? I guess, and I don't have the answer, maybe because if the price changes enough, people will switch to wine or some, some other type of alcoholic product. I don't really know the answer to that one. That one's a little surprising to me. Now, more elastic products. Beef is elastic. And I guess the, the issue there is if the price of beef were to go up like it has in the last five years, you would start buying more pork or chicken. So there are other substitutes. Uh, restaurant meals, that's a luxury item. Lamb and mutton, probably a luxury item. And there are other substitutes, etc. Back to the issue of how price elasticity of demand affects total revenue. Remember, you were thinking about raising the price of your product. Looking at this, this uh, equation for total revenue, that means price would go up, which at first blush would tell you that total revenue would go up, until you consider as price is going up, quantity is going down. So these are opposing forces. So then the issue is, does the price go up more than the quantity goes down as a percentage? If so, total revenue goes up. If the price goes up by a smaller percentage than quantity goes down, in other words, quantity decrease is greater than the price increase, then total revenue is going to go down. It's going to follow the direction of either price or quantity, which what either one has the largest percent change. And I'm going to show you a graphic that lays that all out for you. But that's the bottom line. That's, that's what it comes down to. Cigarettes. We saw two slides ago, cigarettes are a highly inelastic product. Buyers do not respond very much to a price change. The response is small compared to the price change, right? Why would that be? The addictive qualities of cigarettes. Should you put them on sale? What happens to total revenue? Again, picture that total revenue equation. Or even write it down on your notebook, all right? Total revenue equals P times Q. P goes, uh, P goes down, right, if, it's, if you put cigarettes on sale. Decrease in P, that leads to an increase in Q. But what's the increase in Q relative to the decrease in P? Small, right? If it has inelastic demand, buyers react uh, in a small way to the price change. The quantity change is smaller than the price change as a percentage. So total revenue equals P times Q. The change in P, and it's going downwards, is much greater than the change in Q, which goes upwards. So total revenue goes down. It follows the largest change, the larger of the two changes. Total revenue will fall. So that's why you would never put cigarettes on sale, and that's why they never do it. All right, here's another example. You sell furniture. Should you put furniture on sale? How about automobiles? 
Both of these products have elastic demand. Buyers overreact to a price change. So if the price change is a downward price change, then the quantity demanded goes up, but the increase in quantity demanded is much greater than the decrease in the price. Total revenue equals P times Q. So P goes down a little bit, Q goes up a lot. Total revenue goes up. It follows the larger of the two changes. Price versus quantity. That's the way to think of it. Write down the equation on a piece of paper if it helps you. Total revenue equals P times Q. And draw an arrow over price, an arrow over quantity. So you're putting furniture on sale. So you have a downward arrow over P that's of moderate size. That's going to make the quantity go up. Now draw an arrow over Q, but a large arrow. That then helps you visualize that would make total revenue go up. That's why products that have elastic demand are often on sale. When that happens, it increases the total revenue for the seller. Here we have a demand curve on the upper graph that's lined up with a total revenue curve down below. Now any demand curve has an elastic region and an inelastic region. The dividing line is unit elasticity. If you are operating in the blue region of this graph, that's the upper part of the demand curve, that's the elastic region. If you're operating in the orange region of this demand curve, that's the inelastic region. Well, what would make you operate in one or the other? Well, what's not been uh, addressed yet is the supply curve. There's a supply curve that's intersecting this demand curve somewhere. Suppose the supply curve is intersecting at uh, $12. So $12 and quantity demanded is 10. So that's a point that's way up on the demand curve. All right, so something happens to increase overall supply, let's say, and now you're intersecting at $10 and 25 quantity demanded. Well, what just happened? The price dropped from 12 to 10, and the quantity demanded increased by 2.5. So that's very elastic because of the region of the curve you're in. In the region of the curve you're in, price is very high compared to quantity demanded, but it becomes less the case as you go from left to right. If you go all the way to the point, suppose your supply curve is intersecting this demand curve at a price of $4. You can picture where that is, right? The point would be $4 and 90 quantity demanded. All right, suppose the price dropped from there, from $4 to $2. So that's a 50% drop in the price. What happens to quantity demanded? It only goes up by less than 10%, right? From 90 to 100. So that's the inelastic region of the curve for that reason. Price is low compared to quantity if you're all the way at the bottom end of that demand curve. And then right in the middle would be unit elasticity, the dividing line. So looking at total revenue below, the only way, so you have Q across the bottom and then dollars of total revenue on the y-axis. As you go from left to right on the x-axis, the only way to do that is by lowering your price. And that's what's happening on your demand curve, right? That makes quantity demand go up. As you do that, it will make total revenue go up in the beginning, in the blue region. Then you'll reach unit elasticity. Then any further decreases in your price actually make total revenue go down because the price change is greater than the quantity change and the price is going down. Here's the equation for total revenue. Again, I like to do this when I'm thinking about the effects a price change has on total revenue if I know whether the product is elastic demand or inelastic demand. I make these little arrows above P and Q and I change the sizes of them depending on how I think the quantity change is compared to the price change. The size of the quantity change versus the price change. There's our equation for price elasticity of demand. Remember that if this gives you a number greater than 1, that means that the numerator must be greater than the denominator.
which means buyers overreacted to the price change, which means it's elastic demand. Now let's go back to our website example. So you are selling your websites for $200. You're considering increasing your website price to $250. If this is your demand curve, what happens to total revenue? Well, total revenue is equal to price times quantity. So just think for the moment about a price of $200. Locate that point on your demand curve. So that would be $200, quantity demanded is 12, right? Total revenue would be represented by the rectangle, which is the blue with the green, because it's price times quantity. The area of that rectangle is the total revenue. And the, the area of a rectangle is the length times the width. In this case, the width would be kind of like the price. So going from the origin to $200, that side of the rectangle is price, 200. The length of the rectangle is going from 0 to 12. So for that reason, 200 times 12 is your revenue, and that's represented by the rectangle, which is comprised of the blue and the green. All right, now your price changes. It goes up to $250. Now there's a different rectangle that represents your total revenue. Now it's the yellow with the green. That represents your total revenue. Now this is a flatter looking demand curve. You remember that if it's a flatter looking demand curve, then you're in the region of the demand curve that is elastic, right? When it's elastic, that means that the quantity change is greater than the price change, all right? But just looking visually at how the total revenue changes, it's a little difficult if you're looking at those rectangles until you realize that the green part is actually common to both. So if you're trying to judge the size of the rectangle that represents total revenue at $200 to the total revenue rectangle at $250, just remember you can remove that green piece and you only need to compare the blue to the yellow. You see what I mean? Well, now it's real clear. Total revenue was greater before the price change. We raised our price. It's a product that has elastic demand because it's a flat demand curve. When you raise your price, Quantity demand is going to go down by a larger percentage than your price increase was, which makes total revenue go down. Now, if demand is inelastic, remember that the numerator is smaller than the denominator. And so let's look at an inelastic demand curve. So this is the website example, except this is a different demand curve now. So now we're looking at what if the demand curve looks like this instead. All right. Again, you're raising your price from $200 to $250, but it's a steeper demand curve. So what's going to happen to total revenue? This is a product with inelastic demand. When you raise the price, what happens to total revenue? Well, visualize the rectangle that represents total revenue at $200. It's the green with the blue, right? Because the price is 200, quantity demanded is 12. And so the rectangle which, with a side of 200 vertically and 12 horizontally is the green with the blue. All right, now the price changes. It goes up to $250. You move to a different point on the demand curve. Now visualize the rectangle that represents total revenue. That would be the yellow with the green which is bigger. It's easier to see if you consider the fact that you don't, since the green is common to both, you don't even have to look at that. You only have to compare the blue to the yellow. Now it's clear that the yellow is larger, so total revenue is greater after the price change. The price went up and total revenue increased. This is a price that has or a product that has inelastic demand. When you increase the price, the quantity demanded is going to be changed by a smaller amount than the price increase was. So total revenue will follow the direction of the price change, which in this case was an increase. This is me uh, showing you for each of the four possibilities what would happen. 
So if it's a product that has elastic demand, that's that uh, middle column. All right, let's think this through. Suppose, so there's a, this is a uh, four quadrants, right? One possibility is it's a product with elastic demand and it's a price increase. All right, so that's that upper left quadrant. The price goes up. That makes quantity demand go down, but the quantity change is larger than the price change. Total revenue will follow the direction of the larger change. So if it's a product with elastic demand and you increase the price, total revenue goes down. What if it's a product with elastic demand and you, and you lower the price? Now quantity demand goes up, but by a larger percentage than the price went down. Total revenue will follow quantity, the direction of the quantity change. That makes total revenue go up. And then with inelastic demand, suppose it's a product that has inelastic demand like cigarettes or gasoline, and the price goes up. Quantity demand is going to go down, by a, but by a small amount. Total revenue will follow the direction of the price change because that's the bigger change. It will go up. Suppose it's a product with inelastic demand like gasoline or cigarettes, and you lower the price, such as if you were going to have a sale, which they never do. Why don't they have a sale? Because if you lower your price to have a sale, quantity demand will go up, but by a small percentage compared to the price decrease. Total revenue will follow the direction of the price change because that's the bigger percent change. All right, here's a quiz for you. Part A, pharmacies raise the price of insulin by 10%. What happens to total revenue? Total revenue in the insulin industry. Does total revenue go up or go down? The second question is, as a result of a fair war, the price of a luxury cruise falls by 20%. What happens to total revenue? All right, so part A, let me just start you off on how to think about this. Part A. Pharmacies raise the price of insulin by 10%. That's a price increase. What do we know about insulin? The price elasticity of insulin, it's inelastic. The demand is inelastic. So buyers are going to react by decreasing the quantity demanded, but by a smaller amount than the price increase was, percentage-wise. How about B? What do we know about the price elasticity of luxury cruises? Very elastic. So that means... Whatever the price change is, a bigger quantity change. So the price is going to go down by 20%. Quantity is going to increase, but by a larger percentage, what does that do to total revenue? You can pause the video here as you think these two questions through. So the pharmacy question, if insulin goes up by 10%, quantity demand is going to go down by a little bit, but not by much compared to the price increase. So the price increase has a bigger effect on total revenue than the quantity decrease. Total revenue will go up. In the case of a luxury cruise, the quantity demand is going to change by a larger percentage than the price change. So lowering the price by 20% is going to lead to a larger increase in quantity demanded than 20%, let's say 40%. So the quantity change, which is an increase, has a bigger impact on total revenue than the price decrease. That makes total revenue go up. Again, it helps if you write down the total revenue equation, TR equals P times Q, and draw arrows above the P and above the Q of appropriate size. Whichever one has the bigger effect, P or Q, total revenue will follow that direction. This is just another set of data which shows you what the demand curve looks like over the range of prices and what the total revenue curve would look like if you align the two, okay? And this is, uh, you can see at high prices, the demand is more elastic. At low prices, the demand is more inelastic. And this is that same data graphed. You can see 
the yellow region of the demand curve is the elastic region because the price is high relative to the quantity demanded. So if you move from point A to point B, you're dropping price by just one dollar, but it makes quantity demanded double. So that's a bigger change in Q as a percentage. So that's the elastic region. Go all the way down to the other end of the demand curve, and you can see going from point G to H, for example, that's a decrease in price, a huge decrease of 50%, but your quantity demanded only goes from 7 to 8. That's not a 50% change. It's much smaller. So then that's the inelastic region of the demand curve. And again, what determines where you are is where the supply curve is intersecting. We're not showing the supply curve here, but the supply curve is intersecting your demand curve at some point. It could be at point B. That means you would be in the elastic region, or it could be at point G or H, that means you're at the inelastic region. This is a really interesting application of price elasticity of demand. Think about the market for illegal drugs. There is a supply of illegal drugs, the sellers make up the supply, and there is the demand for illegal drugs, the buyers make up the demand. What do you know about the demand curve? Would it have elastic demand or inelastic demand? Inelastic, right? Just like cigarettes, it's a product with very addictive qualities, so it would be, have a steep demand curve. All right. Now, one of the effects of illegal drug use is it causes crime. In fact, a large percentage of crime is directly connected to drug use. It is the drug users that commit the crimes, right? We know this. So if you want to reduce crime, you would think that a way to approach that would be to decrease total revenue in the illegal drug market, right? Decrease expenditures, total expenditure on illegal drugs. All right, so how do you do that? There's a couple ways to fight, crime, to decrease illegal drug use, which then will lead to decreased crime. For simplicity's sake, let's assume that every dollar value of, of drug-related crime is equal to a dollar spent on illegal drugs. So think of the case where there's burglary and theft and other types of crimes where uh, drug users are trying to steal money to spend on drugs. So every dollar of crime is equal, equal to a uh, dollar spent on drugs. This is an oversimplification, but, but let's just uh, imagine that for the moment. So again, the demand curve is inelastic. It's a steep de uh, demand curve. And so let's look at the demand curve and the supply curve. There's two ways to approach uh, the illegal drug market. We can have, law enforcement can have a policy of interdiction or a policy of education. Interdiction would be where they're trying to interfere with the supply. They're trying to track down the uh, drug dealers and supply and interrupt the supply chain of drugs coming into the market. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to educate drug users, have education programs in our schools and focus more on that, which affects the demand curve. And so let's look at those two cases. First interdiction. What would this do to total revenue, total expenditure on in, in the illegal drugs market. And you remember, you want to decrease that because that will decrease crime. All right, well, we're starting at demand curve D1 and supply curve S1, okay? Pick those two out. Find that point. Find the equilibrium point, which shows you the price of illegal drugs and the quantity demanded of them, all right? Now, if you're going to interrupt the supply chain and focus on arresting drug dealers, what does that do to total revenue in the illegal drug market? Well, that's going to shift the supply curve to the left, decrease in overall supply, right? Which drives up the price of illegal drugs. But the demand is highly inelastic. So the quantity of demand it goes down, but just by a small amount relative to the price increase. This actually makes total revenue go up. It makes total expenditure increase which increases crime, this on its own. You know, we're isolating these two approaches to, to, uh, to uh, dealing with the drug issue, 
but that on its own actually makes total revenue go up. The price increase is greater than, as a percentage, the quantity demanded decrease. On the other hand, if you focus on education, that shifts the demand curve. That decreases overall demand for illegal drugs. And if you compare the rectangles, this is very easy to see, right? You're starting, look at the equilibrium point to begin with, the intersection of D1 and S. So the price is P1, the quantity demanded is Q1. Then you shift that demand curve. The price goes down and the quantity demanded goes down. Total revenue goes down. That means total expenditure goes down, which means total, rev uh, total crime goes down. So you get a better bang for your buck, is what this is saying an economist would tell you, if you focus more on education. Now, you really do both of these things. It's not one or the other. But this is just telling you that if you're successful in shifting the demand curve through education, that will have the greater effect on decreasing crime. Price elasticity of supply takes the same approach to looking at the responsiveness of sellers to a price change. Remember the law of supply says as the price of the product goes up, the quantity supplied by sellers goes up. And it's mainly because of the profit incentive. If you're selling your product for more, other things equal, assuming your costs are not also increasing, then your profit is greater. So if the price goes up, profit increases, that's incentive for you to want to sell more. So the quantity supplied goes up. But the question is, by how much does the quantity supply go up relative to the price increase? And of course, we also are looking at a price decrease making quantity supply go down. So elasticity of supply is measuring the sensitivity of sellers to the price change. How much more do they bring to market? How much, how, how, how much more greater quantity of product when the price goes up? That's price elasticity of supply. This is a very similar formula at the top, except in the numerator now we have quantity supplied. So the price changes as a percentage that goes in the denominator. Sellers respond with a quantity supplied change that goes in the numerator. Again, we will use the midpoint formula and this will always give you a positive number, right? Because if the price change is a positive uh, change in the denominator, then the quantity change is also positive. You have positive numbers in both the numerator and denominator. If the price goes down, that's a negative change in price. In the denominator, do you have a negative number? Well, then the quantity supply is also negative in the numerator. So you're always going to get a positive number for price elasticity of supply. Just like with the demand curve, if you end up with a price elasticity of supply that's greater than one, then you say demand is elastic, or I'm sorry, supply is elastic. If you end up with a number that's between zero and one, in other words, less than one, then you say that supply is relatively inelastic. If you're exactly one, then that's unit elasticity. So what determines whether the supply of a product is either elastic or inelastic? Uh, the biggest determinant is the time period being considered. The more time sellers have to react to the price increase, then the more elastic supply will be. So in general, the more capital intensive the industry is, if, it, if you have to buy lots more equipment and lots more facilities in order to produce and sell more, then you're going to be less responsive to a price change. If it's relatively easy to scale up how much you're producing, to scale up your production operations, like in light manufacturing or services, then the elasticity of supply is going to be a larger. That's basically the determinant. So this is chapter six, price elasticity of demand and price elasticity of supply. When we get to the next chapter, chapter seven, we're moving on to the supply side of the market now, and we're going to discuss costs of production for sellers. See you there.